Whew. Okay. Tori, as a climate activist, why is it so important that everyone is talking about climate right now and this crisis? And I also want to ask you what Stop Cambo is and why that is so incredibly important at this specific moment. Yeah, so thank you so much, Emma, for creating the space. It seems like just a while ago that we were sitting and discussing this as a pipe dream, and it just seems incredible that everyone's here. So first of all, I just want to say to everyone that speaking about the climate crisis is the precursor to action. Because so often there's so much in the way of you know, this discourse where we're talking about climate justice and we're talking about all of these different things that we need to do. And I feel as though that in itself is the first step to taking action and mobilizing in the masses. So for me, talking about climate action, climate grief, and all the intricacies associated with the climate crisis is partly to do with that. For me, it's also something that I find incredibly therapeutic. I think that talking about the climate crisis makes it more real, and it allows us to find this space where we can imagine this to be this very tangible thing that we are faced with at the moment. Uh, and so for me, that's why I find it incredibly important. And Emma, you asked about Stop Cambo, and I'm really grateful for that, because we are currently in Glasgow, in Scotland. And I think I'm sure a few of us in this room already know but Shell and Sicker Point Energy are trying to open a new oil field in the North Sea. Now, this is obviously something which is incredibly problematic, but we have the facts and the figures to back that up. The International Energy Agency said that if we want to keep within 1.5 degrees of warming, we have to stop granting licenses to every single oil and gas initiative that is trying to get a footing in this world. And with that, it's also important to remember that this isn't just some abstract thing. In the first phase, they want to extract 170 million barrels of oil. And in their second phase, they want complete field extraction, which equates to 800 million barrels of oil, by which point this will be you know, 2050, where Scotland has claimed that they want to be net zero. So it's just incompatible. And so I wanted to take the time today to shed light on this, because I feel like we have a really good chance of stopping Cambo. And I feel like, as well, that if we stop Cambo, this sets the precedent for every single oil field mm -hmm. around the world to be ended, because we cannot, cannot continue extracting any more fossil fuels if we want to stay within 1.5 degrees of warming. Um, speaking of 1.5 degrees of warming, um, I wanted to ask Greta, uh, even though you're just 18, you've been at so many of these negotiations now and <laughs> conversations, and I'm curious what you think needs to be agreed here at COP to keep the world's temperature below 1.5 degrees to keep that hope real and alive and what we need to do to hold our leaders to account. I mean, to be honest, I mean, we probably all know that the changes that are necessary will not come from inside these conferences. Um, that is the harsh reality. As it is now, the COP has t sort of turned into a greenwash campaign, a PR campaign for CEOs, world leaders, politicians to make great speeches that are broadcasted to make, the, to make it seem like they are taking action. But they are not actually doing that. And even though they, they say that they care for the planet, that does not reflect on their actions. So it feels like we just need to realize how disconnected from reality these conferences are. We cannot solve a climate crisis which is caused by these, by these systems within the same systems that created it. And so we need to, we need to create awareness to make sure that people around the world realize what is happening or rather what is not happening during these conferences to, to put massive pressure on them because un, without mass, massive pressure from the outside they will continue to get away with not doing anything and just continue going blah 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 um, not being held accountable so that's kind of what I think since we are so far from what would actually be needed I think what would we consider a success 
would be if people realize what a failure this COP is. Malala, I wanted to ask you as a gender equality and education activist, why you think that gender equality is not just relevant to this conversation, but it's actually essential. Um, thank you so much to all the speakers and MRGU for uh, bringing us all together and reminding us that climate change is not uh, a separate issue. It's not an issue that should be treated in isolation. It is connected to other issues that we are talking about. Climate change, girls' education, gender equality are not separate issues. Young women are disproportionately impacted by climate crisis. And one study that at, we conducted at Malala Fund shows that 4 million girls this year may not finish their school because of the climate-related events that they will face. Could be from floods to droughts that could cause displacements to uh, uh, even damaging and, and washing out their, their schools. And this statistic will only get worse if leaders don't take urgent action. So I hope that at COP26, um, the work that you are doing, that Malala Fund and other organizations are doing with, with students, with young activists, will show leaders that uh, the only way forward for us uh, to have a safe, cleaner, and better future is to take climate action seriously, to not see it in just uh, isolation, but to see it in relation to uh, other issues as well, from gender equality to girls' education. Uh, and we know that the skills that girls learn at school, from critical thinking to creative problem solving, prepare them to be better advocates for themselves. They can secure green jobs and develop solutions to the social justice issues at the root of this crisis. And it also helps countries to build you know, better climate resilience and reduce emissions and grow their economies. So my message is this, that educate girls, ensure that all children around the world can have climate uh, education, they can have gender education, uh, and that they take climate action seriously. Uh, you know, there is, there is no, there is no time in this. You know, you have to take this seriously and take immediate actions. Thank you, Malala. Uh, Dominique, as a climate justice advocate, what does climate justice mean to you? And what would a just transition mean? And how can you see that being achieved? So with climate justice, it's all about how we go about safeguarding our planet and concrete climate action that acknowledges the intersectionalities of the climate crisis and that the climate crisis doesn't exist in a vacuum and social and economic inequalities will only be exacerbated by this. So it's looking at those who will be disproportionately impacted and those who are already being disproportionately impacted. So that includes gender justice, as Moala was just talking about, that includes racial justice, that includes having justice at the heart of climate action. Because with environmental justice as well, it's looking at how everyone deserves the right to a clean and healthy environment, to clean water, to clean air, to green spaces, and not everyone has that right. Not everyone has access to resources or the ability in these situations when faced with the crisis to mitigate that and to deal with that. And it's really looking at all of those different aspects. And that really links perfectly into a just transition, which is all about making sure that we decarbonize in a way that doesn't leave anyone behind, that protects vulnerable communities, that protects marginalized communities, and brings everyone along with us. And with climate justice as well, it's also about looking at loss and damages and looking at climate reparations. You know, I have family in Jamaica and them, like many other island nations, can already see the impacts of the climate crisis and the impact that that has had, mainly from um, the richest countries who are continuing to extract so many resources. So we have to end the extraction of our natural world and the exploitation of our natural resources and people, which is so, so interlinked. And there is a vision of a better world another world is possible and we can have justice at the heart of that and one in which all of these intersectionalities are truly included in that. Daphne, I think that leads on to a question I'd love to ask you. As a disability climate activist, I'm curious why you think we need a public health approach to end the climate crisis. Well, 
First, I am so grateful to be here today with all of you um, and all of our conversations getting ready for this event. It was just such good energy and I'm so honored to be here. But to answer your question, I think first off it's simple. The climate crisis is a public health crisis. Um, as we see, the way that we talk about the pandemic, the way that in my other field of work we talk about gun violence, especially in America, the climate crisis is equally, if not important, if not more important, a public health crisis in the same regards. Um, when we talk about how the climate crisis is a social determinant of health, it impacts the quality of our health care tremendously. When we talk about um, high rates of asthma in black and brown communities, when we talk about eco-anxiety and how young people especially are seeking um, therapy and treatment for something that they don't even have the proper language and words to describe, how are we going to help these young people when there isn't even any infrastructure to talk about the climate crisis in a public health perspective? Um, I also think that when we talk about disability and climate, that it in itself is, again, another public health issue because disabled folks are at the front line of the climate crisis. When we think about frontline communities, we usually think about you know, those of low socioeconomic status, those communities of color, but where are the disabled folks in that conversation? When we think about how our climate is changing, we think about how people are being displaced. And when we talk about evacuations, disabled folks are usually at the bottom of that totem pole when we talk about those with physical disabilities. Additionally, when we talk about um, the radical shift of our weather patterns, many disabled individuals have um, heat intolerance and other issues that can be aggravated by climate. And if we cannot have uh, a reliable way to understand the way that where we live is how it's going to change, we're not going to be able to live safely in these environments. Uh, I also think that there is an immense amount of ableism that exists inherently within environmental conversations and environmental justice in general. When we look at the past years, how uh, the globe really has been fixated on banning plastic straws things of that nature, plastic straws and other equipment, are literal lifelines for many disabled folks to nourish themselves, to be able to drink and eat. Uh, you know, I shouldn't be able to go to a restaurant, ask for a straw, and then be judged by the server because I'm simply trying to enjoy my food just like everyone else. Um, and I think it's, again, the same way how the fossil fuel industries have put the individual responsibility on us. The same thing goes for the disabled community. It is not our responsibility. We should be able to have alternatives that allow us to live our lives to the best, of our, best quality possible whilst being able to be conscious about our environment. But having conversations around banning plastic and things of that nature are inherently ableist, and we're not going to solve the climate crisis by having ableism at the forefront. Vivi, you asked me to ask you, as an indigenous activist, how you think racism and neo-colonialism impact on environmental struggles, and can you explain what neo-colonialism means for people that don't know? Claro que sí. En primer lugar, reconozco este espacio y pedía precisamente la solicitud puntual de esta pregunta, porque reconozco además que, que es este un escenario único, histórico para muchas de nosotras. Es decir, acá estamos enviando un mensaje claro y es que hablar de activismo climático no es simplemente y en abstracto hablar de luchas individuales que se generan en algún espacio del mundo. Estamos hablando de diversificar la lucha y cada una de nosotras representa maneras de hacerlo. Y es en la diversidad donde se empieza entonces a tejer cómo y generar respuestas, diría en primer lugar. Tengo traducción, entonces tengo que ser un poco consciente de eso. So firstly, I would like to thank for the space and to recognize this space. And I specifically asked for this question because I understand that this space is unique, is a historic opportunity, that we can send a clear cut message that climate activism is not a fight of individuals. It is a fight of diversity. And this is clearly shown by the panel here. Each and every one of us shows this diversity. Entonces, eh, 
tomo este escenario casi para dirigirme puntualmente a esas otras personas a las que uno quisiera hablarles, mirándolo a los ojos, digo que el racismo es puntualmente eso, tiene que ver con invisibilización, tiene que ver con además eh, la pretensión de quitarle dignidad a pueblos que históricamente han tenido dignidad. Los pueblos indígenas son dignos, no hay que hablar de ellos como voces que no existen o que no están. Es que no, no, uno no reconoce, sinceramente, uno no reconoce y no ve lo que no quiere ver, pero las voces están ahí. And I would like to use this space to speak to people that I might not be able to reach otherwise, because racism has to do with invisibilization. It has to do with taking away our dignity, because indigenous people have their dignity. There are people full of dignity and history, and their voices must be heard. Y cuando hablamos de neocolonialismo, es precisamente esas maneras de dominio que pretenden quitar dignidad. Entonces, reconozco el rol, por ejemplo, de eh, Alicia, que está aquí, que es una de las intérpretes, y es una forma de generar voz. Es decir, cuando llegamos a estos escenarios, es mi primera COP realmente, en la que estoy asistiendo, y se nos dice, para ser escuchado, tienes que hacerlo en formato, en nuestro formato, en nuestra lógica, y eso implica hablar un idioma desconocido para nosotros, eh, adaptarnos a ciertas maneras pero ellas se vuelven nuestra voz, ellas se vuelven nuestras maneras y, y creamos una relación mutua para empezar a entender este mundo que es ajeno y que es externo, pero esto va y de esto implica inclusividad, generar espacios y hacer esfuerzos porque se den. Y el racismo es precisamente el, el enviar un mensaje contrario de adaptación. Ellos tienen que venir aquí y hablar nuestro idioma para que nosotros podamos escuchar, pero ustedes tienen que escuchar en nuestras maneras y de eso se va y de eso va el neocolonialismo y esos son ejemplos claros esas son respuestas totalmente antirracistas So now to talk about neocolonialism it is an also a uh, form of taking away our dignity So Alicia is here with me today she's my interpreter and it is the first time that I'm here at COP and she is my voice because we need to be heard And we come here and they tell us that we have to speak a language we don't understand. They have to, we have to speak in a certain way with their own rules. But we have to be heard and our logic has to be heard and our language has to be heard. And our ways have to be heard and to be understood. That is, is what generates inclusivity. And they have to listen to us in our own voices and in our own terms. I think it's so important what you're saying and um, I'd love to give you more time now. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you talked to me earlier this morning about Cosmos and I'd love to understand a little bit more about what you explained to me. Um, hablaba de Cosmovisión y decía, eh, podemos amarrar esta pregunta a esta otra, hablando de Cosmovisión. Y en más de una ocasión ha sido, ¿qué es esto de la cosmovisión? Y yo creo que de eso va cuando hablamos de respuestas antirracistas. Es decir, empezar por generar el interés, no solamente en la diversidad del otro, simbólica, no solamente en el aspecto simbólico de ese otro, sino del interés puntual de su voz, de su forma de pensar, de la forma de entender el mundo. Yes, I wanted to add this uh, to, the, to the first question because I am usually asked, what is Cosmovision? Well, it is our answer to racism. It is, uh, goes far beyond this symbolism of diversity, it's a concrete answer to, again, answer this, this attack on us that is racism. Eh, la cosmovisión es precisamente eh, entrar a lo más profundo de las preguntas que se hace el ser humano y es por la existencia. ¿Quién soy? cómo me entiendo en el mundo, cómo me relaciono con él. Y yo diría que es ahí, en el corazón de esas preguntas, que empezamos a generar respuestas y lo que nos ha llevado a la crisis que hoy reconocemos y todas las mujeres maravillosas con las que me encuentro han reconocido también. Y muchos líderes lo reconocen, pero se niegan a tomar respuestas inmediatas. Um, Cosmovision tries to, under, to understand and to answer existential questions. Who are we? What is our relationship with Mother Earth? And it is at the heart of these fundamental questions that we find the answers to this crisis and the answers that the world leaders have to hear to actually end this crisis. Para el pueblo arhuaco de donde yo vengo, para ser muy concretos, porque en realidad es muy amplio el tema, 
Eh, nosotros los arhuacos entendemos que la Sierra Nevada se sitúa en el corazón del mundo. Los científicos se preguntarían, ¿es o no es el corazón del mundo? Y buscarían probarlo. Los arhuacos lo que hacemos es reconocemos que es el corazón del mundo y lo protegemos, porque es lo más sagrado que tenemos, es nuestra tierra, es nuestra casa. Entonces, en ese sentido, los arhuacos eh, al nacer se nos asigna una responsabilidad, es, independiente de lo que usted entienda por, por existencia, responda a esa existencia con corresponsabilidad. So I come from the Arhuaco community and we believe that Sierra Nevada, our region, is the heart of the world. So scientists might not agree with us that we, it's the heart of the world, but we believe so. And we pre protect our home and our territory and our earth because it is sacred for us. We are each born in our community with a responsibility, with a corresponsibility towards Mother Earth. I'm curious, as an environmentalist and as a scientist, how does biodiversity tie into the larger issue of climate change, and what is 30 by 2030? Um, I think, in general, when we're talking about climate change, I think someone's already mentioned it, we talk about it in a vacuum, like it is a single issue, untouched by anything else, and we absolutely have to be intersectional when we approach it, we've talked about this. Um, but I think one of the things that people don't talk about enough is the other issues that we're dealing with, that um, I suppose our planet is dealing with, and biodiversity is absolutely one of those, and it absolutely links into climate change in a way that I think we don't acknowledge enough, even if perhaps we know it subconsciously, talking about things like planting a trillion trees to try and deal with climate change, to try and negate the effects, things like that. We know um, that we're losing our wildlife, our nature. Um, here in the UK, I think um, people don't realize because our, our countryside has been in such a crisis for so long. Um, but I've been very lucky, I've traveled a lot and it is one of the most nature depleted countries I have ever been to. Um, and all of this is symptomatic of the wider issue in the, we just keep on taking from our planet. Because um, that is what climate change boils down to, that is what biodiversity loss boils down to. The prioritization of money, of profit, over looking after our planet, and quite frankly ourselves, our planet's gonna carry on spinning. Um, it's humanity that is suffering because of our greed. And I think you see that as well um, in our government, in COP in general, which me and many other activists who I've talked to feel is quite frankly farcical or has been so far. Um, and over and over again, we're seeing the refusal to prioritize climate change and other environmental issues over anything else, despite the fact that we know that this is an existential crisis. Um, and so I think climate change is the big issue, the global issue. Um, and I feel like biodiversity is the representation of that on a much smaller scale. And I think it's when you start seeing um, companies, world leaders, governments, people in general, caring about biodiversity and the general state of our planet, that's when you start to recognize that people care about these wider environmental issues as well, because you absolutely have to start at the ground up to begin building back better and pushing back against you know, capitalism, consumerism, this pattern of taking and taking. Thank you. Uh, Vanessa, this is an area that you've worked in extensively. Why are governments being asked to stop burning fossil fuels today? And do we think that this is realistic? Just use this. Hi, um, so happy to be with all of you guys. Uh, I think that if we are to have a chance to limit global temperatures to 1.5 degrees, uh, we have to stop, governments have to stop all new fossil fuel developments. And I just also want to talk about how uh, 1.5, how we all look at 1.5 as our salvation, I should say. And I think it really 
disconnects from what is happening on the ground. I can say that at 1.2 degrees, it is already hell and catastrophic for many communities in my country, across Africa, across the global south. And it's evident that the climate with the rising global temperatures, uh, the weather patterns are continuously changing, they're continuously being disrupted, and people are losing their homes, people are losing their farms, people are losing their businesses and their livelihoods. So to, to stop um, all new fossil fuel developments will give us a chance to, you know, 1.5 degrees, but I can say that 1.5 degrees will not be safe for communities like mine, because even right now, it's already evident that the climate crisis is ravaging different parts of the African continent, which is, you know, ironic given that Africa historically is responsible for only 3% of global emissions. Uh, with the gravity of everything that we've just discussed, I wanted to take a moment to ask you to imagine that you had a microphone in your hand and suddenly everyone in the world can hear you and that anything is possible. And then to please complete my sentence. If I got to have a one-on-one -on -one with my leader, I would tell him. And Dominique, I, you said that you wanted this one. <laughs> you liked this one. I would tell him to, like, enough is enough and we will not stand by a side and watch our planet burn and you continue to take inaction. And that now is the time, yesterday was the time, and history shows how responsible the UK, for example, is for what is happening right now. And that is it, we need action right now and enough is enough. everyone know this one piece of indigenous wisdom, I would say. <laughs> okay, si tuviera la oportunidad de compartir um, un dato de los pueblos indígenas es, ahí está la respuesta aparte de la crisis que hoy tenemos y eh, solo generando voz podemos encontrarla, pero haciéndolo realmente. So if I could just pick, uh, pick one of the many indigenous wisdom that we have, is that the indigenous people have the answer to this crisis, but only if they are heard in their own voices and their own terms. Greta, if I could have everyone in the world know this one fact, it would be. Well, we'll need to know a lot of things, but if it was only one thing, <laughs> then I would maybe say that what you do actually makes a difference. Um, there seems to be a misconception that what we as individuals do uh, doesn't have an impact. And then I'm not talking about not using plastic or so on. I'm talking about going out in the streets and making our voices heard, organizing marches, um, demanding change. Uh, it seems like people don't actually realize what power one individual has. Um, but I think that we've shown everyone in this panel, everyone in the climate movement, what we can achieve when we actually do things and when we go out collectively and demand for change. Um, and there's, it's not a coincidence that that is a case that people don't seem to believe that they have the power to change things. The people who are benefiting from this system, the people who are benefiting from the business as usual, they don't want us to know what we can actually achieve. Um, so in order to, to get out of this, this situation, we need to realize what power we have and we, we need to reclaim that power because the power truly lies within the people and we need to realize that. Daphne, if I could instate this one law starting tomorrow, it would be? Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I think the law would have to be having 
you know, the leaders of fossil fuel industries having to go into the communities before they even start drilling, before they even start destroying them, and look at the people in their eyes, walk to those communities, and understand on a human level, these are the lives that you're choosing to actively destroy. These are the communities that you're actively destroying. I think um, the, one of the most powerful tools we have to instill any sort of change making is the power of storytelling and the power of sharing our human stories. So I think what's missing in this movement and why the fossil fuel industry has become so ravaging is the fact that they only think with one thing and that's money. They forget about all the humanity. They forget all, about all of the people that they're actually affecting. And if we were able to bring them in and you know put a megaphone on, on them and say, here are the actual human lives, the babies, the mothers, the sisters, the cousins, the people that we hold near and dear, um, I think hopefully it would make them think twice about it. I also think they'd be able to see firsthand the segregation of environmental racism and how, you know, yes, your money does give you so, uh, a barrier for how you feel the effects of the climate crisis. But I think what would be most important is for them to understand that money is only going to protect you for so long. At one point or another, we're all going to feel the catastrophic burdens of the climate crisis. And your money's going to get burned in that fire anyway. So there's nothing you're going to be able to do with it. Um, so I think we have to shift our focus from you know, our personal pockets to humanity and sharing stories with each other. Vanessa. If I could make corporations and businesses do this, I would. <laughs> Thank you. I would make them understand that we cannot eat coal, we cannot drink oil, and we cannot breathe so-called natural gas. And for them to understand that there is really no future in an industry that is continuously harming uh, generations, that is continuously taking away people's livelihoods and just destroying our hopes and our dreams for you know a better world. And I would I would make them understand that it's possible to have another world and it's necessary for all of us to have another world because in the end we are all facing the same storm and the climate crisis at some point it will affect all of us if uh, nothing is done about it. So I would also make them understand that if we are to get another world, it won't just be for us, it will be for all of us, whether you're speaking or you're not speaking. Yeah. Tori. If I could change this one thing about the environmental movement, it would be? So I kind of want to preface it by saying that I don't want this to distract from the accountability of those in power, because at the end of the day, you know, power is such an important thing if we want to get things done. So in the context of the environmental movement, I often think about coalition building. And what that means is that when we talk about climate justice, climate justice means racial justice, climate justice means disability justice, climate justice means gender equality and everything that comes under that. And far too often in the environmental movement, I see people sticking to these realms that they're so passionate about, but we're so much stronger when we work together. So what that means is I want people to reach across the aisle to talk to people who are on the front lines of the racial justice movement, to talk to those who are on the front lines of the disability justice movement, and band together. Because honestly, we are so much stronger when we work together. And Emma and I talk a lot about bad activism. And, and you know that was a platform that we started uh, a while ago to dismantle the guise of perfectionism in the environmental movement. And so what that means, rightly what Greta said, you know. I don't care if you use a plastic straw. I don't care if you're not vegan. All I care is that you work together and you take action because perfectionism is a distraction and it is something that allows those in power to blame individuals as opposed to realizing that they are the ones responsible. So bad activism for me is a way of staying sane, quite frankly, in this movement because 
believe me, we all, we all berate ourselves and we think we're not doing enough, but, but that's a lie, it's a sham. We're, we're doing exactly enough as we are if we work together. So that is something that I would like all environmental groups and outside of the environmental group uh, to, to band together and to build coalitions. Maya, this is the 94th COP. If I could make next year different, I would. This isn't going to be a sentence, sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, yeah, you're right. This, there have been 26 COPs. It's been going on since 1994. That's such a long time. We've known about climate change for such a long time. There is clearly something that is not working. Um, I think personally, one of my biggest issues with COP and with conferences like this in general is that it's still incredibly hierarchical and the fact that these Western nations absolutely still have the main governing power within these conversations despite the fact that these are issues affecting the global south, people in the global south by far the most. Um, and we're still seeing that legacy of colonialism today within these politics and that absolutely has to be pushed back against in some shape or form. We need um, to be listening to the voices of activists from the global Global South Indigenous activists more. We need to be um, prioritizing the, the priorities of leaders from the Global South. You can have things like amazing um, speeches from the Barbados and places like that, and then people just sort of ignore it once it's done, and we have to push back against that. Um, but I think in general, you know, my, my family's from Bangladesh, and that is a country that has about five million climate change refugees living in the capital city right now. That number's increasing every day. And to be honest, I would quite like our world leaders to have to go and to look those people in the eye and to acknowledge that those people are suffering because of lack of action from them. And quite frankly, if they, don't, if they didn't come to a decision in my lovely hypothetical COP, um, they would have to bring those people back with them and give them a home because they are the ones who have stolen their homes in the first place. Malala, if everyone could magically have read one book starting now, I would pick. A Bigger Picture by Vanessa Nagata. Uh, size is inspiration and indispensable voice for our future. So we must read her book right now and uh, listen to the voices of all these activists we have here at the table. And uh, you know the root cause, the root problem is is the same. That is prioritizing profit over people in the planet. And we are telling all of you how it is impacting different segments and and parts of society from uh, um, women and girls to uh, indigenous communities. So I think we are, all, we are all here for the same issue and we are telling you that you know, climate change should not just be treated as an issue in isolation, but it is impacting all of us in, in, in many different ways. So we need immediate action in this issue. Um, it's been such an honor. I'm so humbled to get to ask you all the questions that you wanted to be asked and to, yeah, it's just been amazing. So thank you. I wanted to close with something that gives you all hope and keeps you all positive. I've spent the last week around all of you and you're all such bright lights and you all have so much hope. Um, and so that was just how I wanted to close. If there was something that you wanted to share that made you, um, that made you hopeful. This panel, for example, <laughs> like you are all so incredible and it's genuinely just, like I sat here for a moment just looking at everyone and just thinking about how far we've come and everyone's journeys and I genuinely start getting quite emotional and just, this is what gives me hope. I, I don't, this is where I get the hope. I get the hope from us. I get the hope from the people. I get the hope from everyone out on the streets. I get the hope from the movement, and that is what has really pushed me forward. And just the power that we all have, and we have seen in the past just how much 
just how movements can be so monumental mm. and that's what gives me hope and we're pushing forward and another world is possible and all that we can save is just so beautiful and we're going to get there and everyone here and everyone out on the streets and everyone in our movement that I work with every day makes me believe that. Mm. Thank you. I think I can also echo what Dominique was saying where this literally started as an idea and it's flourished and it's, it's really beautiful to see everybody here. And I also want to give a really big shout out to Vivi. We met two years ago in Cartagena and that was the start of Sail for Climate Action, Unite for Climate Action. And to see you sitting here next to me after two years is it's joy, it's so much joy. <laughs> so thank you. Eh, yo solo <laughs> no tengo palabras eh, fuera de, de todo esto. Eh, pienso que, que esto, y estoy muy de acuerdo con lo que decía Dominique, eh, las respuestas no solo están en la COP, lo que dicen los líderes. Yo creo que este escenario, este espacio, es una manera de decir, estas también son respuestas legítimas para confrontar esta crisis y no solo se encuentran allá, eh, porque como decía Greta y tiene toda la razón, el, si hay un cambio que se va a hacer y se necesita, no es ahí donde vamos a encontrar respuesta. I am lacking the words, uh, but I believe and I agree completely with what Dominic says. The answers are in this space, the answers that we need. And this space is precisely what we need and also what uh, not, it's not at the COP. So the answers will come from spaces like this, exactly what, what Greta was saying. And change will only be possible if more spaces like these are available. What gives me hope is the fact that Gen Z is not waiting. We're doing this work right now. We are holding our electeds accountable, but we're also becoming elected. In America, uh, back at home, you know, in our congressional uh, elections, we're seeing the highest number of Gen Z uh, candidates ever. Uh, I myself ran for election two years ago, I won my position in my community, and I get to represent. Thank you, and it, it's true. It was truly been uh, the greatest honor, and I'm honored to have won re-election. Um, but it's things like that. Um, you know, we always say that our leaders have failed us, but the great thing about Gen Z is that we are the new leaders. We don't have to. Uh, we don't have to ask for agency. We don't have to ask for permission anymore because we are the ones who are going to make decisions going forward. Like, obviously the same as everyone. There are so many amazing people in this movement. And I think for me personally, because um, I've been doing environmental campaigning for eight years now, and even in that period, seeing the amount of momentum that this movement has gained, the hundreds of thousands of people who have been pouring out into the streets to make their voices heard, I just, I feel every day, like, you know, whenever I feel tired, you know, so many people care, so many people care so passionately and I think you know this movement has no option to succeed you know that's that's how I feel you know because people are so powerful I think that's what this boils down to people are incredibly powerful and we will save this planet <laughs> Yeah, um, I can only uh, echo the things that have already been said. I mean, and that's also the reason why I'm so hopeful, because you say, I mean, you're so wise, everyone. Um, and I'm so happy to be a part of this movement, not only the, only the climate movement, but all the movements that are connected to the climate movement. Um, the power truly lies within the people. And I think we have shown that during, not only the, during this COP, but during during a long time and we are starting to reclaim that power um, and I, I don't think we would still be activists if we didn't believe that change was possible if we weren't hopeful that we could actually uh, achieve change and um, because as you said we have no other choice we have so much to fight for and we got yeah 
it's the only way forward, and we will, we will achieve that. I am certain. Yeah, I think mine is the same with everyone else because um, I remember a time when I couldn't, I didn't have the strength to continue striking because it, it felt like we continued to strike and the disasters continued to happen and the leaders continued not to do anything about it. And it was a moment of you know, sadness and frustration and depression, and I just couldn't strike. But when I got out of that situation, I decided that I will have hope. And I started to understand that I wasn't alone. And like this was a global movement. And I just started to you know, feel like, uh, like I'm part of all these amazing people who are organizing and mobilizing and to also understand that if I need to rest and not strike uh, on a specific Friday, I would know that someone out there is still speaking. And I, I also believe that if they also feel they need to rest, I will also be speaking. So I think that is something that has really given me hope in the movement to know that there are so many people who are mobilizing and organizing for a better future and to know that I can rest when I need to because someone else will still be you know, speaking up. So thank you guys. Yeah. Final note from you, what gives you hope? What gives me hope is the voices of young people around the world asking for change. Uh, and for as long as there's will, for as long as there's this passion for change, we must all remain optimistic. I think there is no choice but to carry on with this passion. If we don't take any action, I think we would be in a far worse situation. And we know that from history, our uh, our uh, ancestors, our parents, grandparents have done so much for us uh, in the past decades and then even centuries back, the women's movement and other activists, the work that they have done has brought us to this stage. So I am hopeful that we can leave something uh, meaningful for our future generations as well. Uh, and so I'm really grateful to each and everyone who is doing their part of the job and making this world a better place for all. But I would like to ask you, Emma, what gives you hope today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think, Vanessa, when you were talking about feeling too tired sometimes to strike on a Friday, uh, it made me think so much about emergent strategy and the idea that actually what we need is large numbers of small synchronized actions all taken together and I think we have cults of personalities and individuals and we put so much pressure and weight on individuals and, and, and certain characters to carry things in a way that's really unhealthy and actually doesn't mimic so much of what is successful in nature and I think getting to be part of this group and meet these women and to, to see how the climate movement is this large force, this, this big, big force of people taking small, manageable size actions really gives me hope and inspires me because I know that it can be sustained, that it is sustainable and it is possible and achievable. It's lots and lots of people doing small things every day that I think will get this done. That gives me hope. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for hearing these unbelievable actors, activists. And um, yeah, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of COP.